my name is Anna Lumpkin. I work with the AIF as the University Program Specialist. I'll be helping monitor the chat function today. So if you have any technical mm -hmm. issues or anything like that, just go ahead and shoot us a chat. It will only go to the panelists. But if you have a general question and you want others to see it, or you have a question for one of the presenters, use the Q&A function and we'll make sure to get to your question. Uh, for attendance today, if you'll go ahead and type in the chat box, I'm here, so that we can mark your attendance as completed, that would be helpful. And I think that's, that's everything, Fred and Roberto, if you guys wanna go ahead and introduce yourselves, and then we'll pull up the presentation. All right, so welcome to Studio AIF. And we have a presentation today that we hope will help you in terms of vacuum and gas cylinder safety. I'll introduce our team here on uh, lead guitar. We have Roberto Garcia. <laughs> Keyboard, we have Anna Lumpkin. And lurking somewhere is uh, Toby Tung, who is uh, on violin. I'm Fred Stevie, and I guess I'm the lead singer. That sounds good. <laughs> so we're going to start off by showing a video which shows you some of the power of uh, gas cylinders. So, Anne, if you want to queue up the first video, that would be the highway to hell. So, you see this truck that just went by with a whole lot of gas cylinders? He drove a little too fast. In fact, he drove way too fast. Now, if you look closely on the left, you'll see the driver running the heck out of there. And you'll see some of these cylinders, which obviously have flammable materials, and they're on fire. You notice the vehicle is backing away. You should be backing further away. Now, there are a lot of gas cylinders left, and that's a big fire. What do you think is going to happen? Notice the people are starting to move further away. Um, we've got we've got something coming up in the middle of the screen, Anna. And they think it's over. You notice some of these cylinders uh, having a little distance here. The guy is taking pictures. Decides that maybe this is even a little too close. You notice the traffic going the other way is actually stopped. So if you're driving a truck with a lot of gas cylinders, don't drive too fast. And you notice some of them spinning around? Yeah, she left. <laughs> Impressive, eh? <laughs> no, it's not I-40. I believe this was in Russia, but... Uh, um, this is giving you the idea of some of the power of gas cylinders. And we have uh, links to all of these videos that we'll show today, and you can copy them yourself. So Anna, you can stop with that. We'll go ahead and go to the slides. So here's our outline where we're going to talk about vacuum theory, safety, the pump, the measurement, and then gas motor safety. Why do we need a vacuum? Ion and electron beams meet a low pressure environment to avoid collisions with gas molecules. Your chamber atmosphere can affect the surface of the specimen. For example, it can oxidize. Gas in the chamber can absorb on the specimen. I'm sure you've all seen the ideal gas law. You've got a relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. It can be used for any gas. But you may not have thought about how fast do these molecules actually move. Your average velocity can be given by this equation. We're not going to show the derivation, but at 20 degrees C, you're about 472 meters per second for nitrogen. I can't run this math. 
Here's another thing you may not have thought about is how fast the molecules arrive at the surface. And at room temperature and 10 to the minus 6, 4, you have about 4 times 10 to the 14 molecules per second striking each centimeter. What does this mean? A monolayer is about 10 to the 15. So in two seconds, if everything that hit that surface sticks, you would cover the surface. Mean free path. This is another important concept. This is the average distance you travel between collisions. So for air at room temperature, we can have a simple equation. Let's check out the mean free path. Now, how about a vacuum cleaner? Well, we've actually taken a vacuum cleaner and measured it. Your normal atmospheric pressure is 764. The vacuum cleaner shows 634. The mean free path is 79 nanometers. So that's not going to work. Here's some examples. So the rotor again pump, which you'll see shortly, has a mean free path of about 10 centimeters. You probably have not handled any vacuum tubes, but they can be pretty good vacuums. Your surface analysis chamber, which is what's used in our instrumentation, has a mean free path of hundreds of thousands of kilometers. There's your pressure on the moon interplanetary space. The lowest pressure on Earth that's been achieved is about 10 to the minus 13 at one of the accelerators. Now let's talk about gas flow. Above 10 to the minus 3, 4, the collisions occur between molecules. Below 10 to the minus 3, 4, the molecules collide with the vacuum chamber. So here you have collisions between the molecules. Here you have collisions with the vacuum chamber. Here's a schematic to show that. So this is where all your pressure is. Once you get below 10 to minus 3, 4, you essentially put all the stress you can imagine would occur on the system. And for example, think about this. Which vacuum chamber needs to be stronger? One at 10 to minus 3, 4, or one at uh, a very low pressure? It's a trick question. The answer is the pressure is essentially the same. The difference between these is insignificant. So that's important to know if you're testing in a vacuum chamber. Once you get to 10 to minus 3, 4, you're pretty well tested. It. Here are some characteristics, and maybe you haven't thought of this, but in rough vacuum, you're basically pumping air, your nitrogen and oxygen. At high vacuum, we have the gases originating from surfaces. The gases are in the molecular flow, not the viscous flow regime. You have mostly water. At ultra high vacuum, the gases originate from surfaces or in the molecular flow regime, but everything you're pumping is hydrogen. Now, let's talk about absorption. Physical absorption occurs when the gases are close to the liquid state at the temperature of the surface. And if you change the gas pressure or the temperature, you can reverse it. So you'll see this absorption like when you're driving and it's been moist out and your car window starts to fog up, condensing on it. The problem that we have in most of your vacuum systems is water. Water is very difficult to pump away because it's sticky. Everywhere, if it's absorbed from the surface, the next surface that hits is going to stick. Hemisorption is something that's actually used in some of the pumps. This is a change from a gas to a solid. Hemisorption occurs with reactive gases and reactive, reactive gases and also with reactive surfaces. So in this case, you're actually a capture pump because you're capturing the gas and the titanium in those pumps. Now, let's talk about some safety issues. Implosion, the pressure on the outside of the vacuum system can be really enormous. You have 14.7 pounds per square inch, or if you like metric, that's 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. So if you've got a flexible bellows and you start to pump on it, it's going to move. And you have the danger of implosion at a glass viewport. If you have a high pressure gas door connected, you may need to have a relief valve so the pressure won't exceed a safe limit. High pressure sources include gas cylinders, 
cryo pump and sorption pump. We'll talk about the pumps in a little bit. Reactive gases can present an explosion hazard. Oxygen, for example, can react with hot oil vapor from a mechanical pump. There's butter ion pumps and cold cathode gauges. They have high voltages. They're on all the time. And you should drown your entire system. As there is gases, you've got to have some way to keep them from getting out to where you're going to breathe them. So you need to be able to vent them. And as there is solid, when you open up your vacuum chamber, you may have exposed some fresh titanium. Or if you've got some nasty gases, something that would be inside the vacuum system. A log book. Record keeping can be very useful. So records should be maintained for everything you're doing with your with your uh, vacuum system. And on a regular basis, your log book should include the base pressure, the time to reach base pressure. That'll tell you if something's going wrong. So for example, this is on our focus line beam instrument. Here's a log, and it can be on your computer. It doesn't have to be handwritten. And this change indicated actually that the gauge is on, on bad. It was not a vacuum change due to something in the instrument. You should also have a diagram of your system. These are called vacuum synoptics. And you can easily Google and look up and get these symbols. There's a simple for a turbo pump. There's a valve. There's a gauge. So by looking at this and having it written down, and especially if you're working in a group, you can make sure that the information is passed along to the next person that's going to do it. Some of these vacuum synoptics are live. So in this particular one, if I click on this, it opens that valve. If I click on this, it would turn off that turbo pump. And the pressures are right there. You have to be careful with live systems because, yes, if I click on this wrong one, I may vent the system. All right, so now we're going to go into the physical viewing of a lot of the materials here. We're going to look at the uh, vacuum component pumps. So we're going to look at these different pumps here, and we're going to start with the four pumps. So the first one we're going to show is a rotary vane four pump. And if you haven't seen these, you'll, uh, you, you certainly probably will. If you look, there's a vein here, and it's eccentric. So as I sweep through here, I'm taking the gas and compressing it. There's a lot of oil here. So oil is used as a seal and it helps lubricate the moving parts. And it can also be a source of contamination. So here's another diagram showing that. This is an example of one of those pumps. This is a rotary vane core pump. Here's your intake, your exhaust. We've got some filter to keep the oil from fitting back into the vacuum chamber, a motor, and here's the actual pump. So this is a direct drive pump or pump. Now, here's your motor. And this is the actual pump. And you say, what's inside that, inside that pump? Well, it turns out the actual pumping area is quite small. This is hard steel. And if you look in here, you can actually see the little vein that turns around. The rest of the volume in here is all oil. The oil helps cool this thing. These pumps are hot. All right, can we go back to the slides? All right, so here's the rotary vane four pump. And on it, there is something called a ballast. And there's a group recently that uh, had a fire, it's not here, University of Pennsylvania. They were pumping ethyl acetate and hexane, and they didn't vent this. So you've got flammable materials, and uh, there's what caused the explosion in the fire. So you're pumping some very highly flammable materials. You have two ways to avoid this, several ways. One is 
to adjust the ballast. And the ballast actually bleeds air into the pump along with what it's pumping. So it makes it less flammable. The other thing which is very important is that your exhaust is vented and it goes somewhere not near the pump. That pump has got a lot of hot oil in it and can start on fire. And I know of another instance where someone had was using oxygen and they pushed the wrong button and dumped a lot of uh, oxygen into the pump and set it on fire. Now we're going to switch to another pump. It's called the dry floor pump or school pump. Why do we do this? No oil. And if you look at this, you're going to see this scroll, the spiral, and another spiral. And as the scroll moves around, one of them sticks, one of them moves, you actually can compress the gas and it'll be pumped away here. So the one scroll moves within the other. You can see I can move the gas, move the gas, move the gas. Really neat uh, design. Hey Fred, we have a question. Um, how much of a concentration of flammable material is needed to blow up a pump? I'm just wondering how long it would take for something bad to happen. If you're pumping any flammable material, I'd really ask you to consult with a few people to see what kind of volume that you have. If it's a very small volume, that's probably not gonna be a problem. But if you've got a process where you're continuing to flow a flammable material, that could be a very significant problem. And before starting to pump something like that, I'll please check with a few people. Uh, the safety department, I'd be happy to talk with you as well, to look at a system and see that you're getting the venting you need and that uh, you may not have an issue, so avoid an issue. The other thing you can consider is having a filter which would react with the flammable material before it hits the pump. Here's your cutaway view of the scroll pump. The scrolls are actually here. The rest of this is all motor. And there are these seals that you have to replace frequently. Well, not that frequently, maybe once or twice a year. Remember to paint your fingernails yellow when you do this. Hey Fred, I have another question. So uh, the question is, what was that yellow stuff on the previous slide the yellow on the end of the motor? I think he was talking about what oh, outside. Yeah. He's asking about the seal. This person is asking about the seal. He's going to show you the seal now. All right, so let's go back to this first. This is that four pump. The gas ballast on this one is right here. It's even written gas ballast. Note that if you turn the gas ballast on, you're not going to get near the same ultimate pressure you did before because you're bleeding air in. Now, this is a scroll floor pump. And if you open one up, this is where the seals go. And the seal material is this Teflon, just a very thin sticky on one side and Teflon on the other. And that sealing surface comes down in here and you have another one that meshes in with it. And this little hole right here is where the exhaust is. So that is your scroll or pump. All right, so now can we go back to the slides? Mm -hmm. The next pump we're going to talk about is a diaphragm pump. It's a membrane pump. And if you look at this, you see some little valves here and a little membrane that goes up and down. And you have an eccentric motion on it. And this eccentric motion with the valves opening and closing gives you a pumping action. These diaphragms are simply like a rubber that's somewhat flexible. And periodically they wear out. Here's an example of one. And this shows you one of the components on it. I'd like to now go back over to Roberto, who's uh, gonna, we're going to show you this. All right. So here is, and if you see this turn, 
it'll be an eccentric motion. Your actual membrane is this, and this simply goes in and out. And unfortunately, over time, you'll see that this rubber gets a little tired and it'll break. So this is something you can do yourself. You can uh, actually move these and see the, a little bit hard to see there, but you can see it being moved in and out. So that's all it is, that's your membrane pump. If, if you've got a fish tank, that's probably what you've got. Our next pump is the diffusion pump. And think of uh, pouring boiling oil on the people assaulting your castle. In this case, we're pouring boiling oil on the gas molecules. If you have a heater, the pressure must be low enough so you have a four pump pumping this that's required and the gas jet here are actually little holes which oil is coming through at supersonic speed the hot oil pushes the gas down you have differential pressure from the top here down to here the gas is pumped away and uh, this is a relatively inexpensive pump it has no moving parts the main issue is uh, here's a lot of oil. Uh, I don't see this quite advanced. So here's an example of one of those. You have cooling coil to get the oil to run back down to the reservoir. Here's your water input for the cooling coils. Here's your thermostat to keep it from overheating. Your heater down here. To attach the vacuum system here, and here's where it would be exhausted to your four pump. So here's an actual diffusion pump, and aha. Uh -huh. So inside, you'll see there are different stages, and you can actually look at it. Here's another one showing you how the oil would go up into the different stages and the jets are all along here. So the oil comes out from them and goes down and traps the gas molecules, which are pumped away by the floor pump. The next pump is my favorite pump, which is a turbo pump. And it's really a miniature jet engine. Their jet engine goes at about 10,000 RPM. These can go as high as 90,000 RPM. We have a couple of those on our XPS system. And what's happening is you actually have these, these uh, blades traveling at very high velocity, and they actually have collisions with the gas molecules. Those collisions push the gas down into the, the bottom of the pump. It needs a four pump to pump those away. And this combination of blades in here is very precisely designed to push the gas out and to your uh, four pump. There's a cutaway. You can see your various rotors here. They're also stators. Those are your blades. So that combination of these helps prevent the gas from coming back up. Blades are made of aluminum. Your pumping speed can be quite high. It depends on the size of the turbo pump. Some of these are enormous. If you have oil from the bearing, some of these can be oil free and they can be a magnetic levitation. You need a four pump to operate them. So here's an actual turbo pump. And I can spin this. And you can just see inside that there are different layers of rotors and stators. So your four pump connection would be here. Your electrical connection to drive the pump is here. And you may have a connection to vent this with nitrogen. If you look at what's inside, here's an example of what those look like. And you'll see that they have different sizes as you go from the top where they're skinny, and at the bottom, they're a little bigger. So this is rotating at very high speed and interacting 
in actual collisions with the gas molecules. There are some pictures of some of the parts that we we're just showing. This is the ion pump, and it's uh, it's like a physics experiment. So you actually have several components going on here. All right, in the middle of these blocks, you have a honeycomb, and you have a high voltage applied, and you have a titanium surface. So how does this work? Well, you actually have a plasma generated. You're ionizing gas molecules with the electrons from this plasma. The material that's ionized, ionized tends to be positive. You make the surface over here negative, so it's attracted to it. The magnetic field helps confine these electrons so they have helical trajectories. They have a better chance of ionizing the gas. So you ionize the gas, the high voltage attracts it to this titanium covered surface, then it's trapped. Usually, this is an area where you have the ultra high vacuum. You can imagine this is not a pump to capture a lot of gas. So, something that at higher pressure, at very low pressure, will last almost forever, will not last very long at a very high pressure. Certain gases don't work as well, such as argon and helium. And you can even have portable ones, which people use for having a sample which is under vacuum, can be operated with a battery. All right, and if you look inside, you'll see this anode, which is here. Your cathode surfaces would be there. Here's an example of one of these honeycombs. So here's one, they tend to be pretty heavy. You can see inside there's this honeycomb. Here's your high voltage connection. So this may have all like six or seven kV on all the time. To give you an idea what that honeycomb looks like, your titanium surface would be down in there. And this would be in the side. This, this is a larger one, obviously. But you can see the honeycomb, the titanium surfaces. All right, so the next one is the titanium sublimator. And this is a case where you have a whole lot of current. And you can easily tell what cable this is set up for because it's the largest one. This doesn't even work until you have about 40 amps going through it. But you actually are taking the titanium and making it so hot that it is going to evaporate titanium. That titanium then captures gas molecules. And once again, it's a capture pump because it's going to put material on the surface. Here's an actual titanium sublimator. And you have these individual filaments. And maybe about $12 or so. So that's your titanium. And if you can possibly see this, one of them that has been used is crystallized. There are a couple that haven't been used and some that are missing. What happens with these? Well, they burn out. So that's why you normally have an array of these on your particular and not just one on your sublimator. The next pump is a cryogenic pump. And you see these, certainly if you're in the semiconductor industry, every one of those deposition systems has a cryo system on it. And you know, companies like CTI. And this works by having these chevrons up at the top, which have a lot of surface area. And you have something that's at essentially liquid helium temperature, so about 40 degrees Kelvin. Everything with a vapor pressure that will condense at a temperature higher than that will tend to be pumped by uh, essentially using this refrigerator and freezing it on the surface. These work really well. They do have some vibration usually. You need to regenerate them periodically because you're going to build up of all the stuff you've been pumping. From a safety standpoint, something to remember. This, all the lines connected to it, the refrigerator, they're all at something like 300 PSI. So if you're making connections or breaking them, you really have to be aware of that. 
there is an example of one. And if you're looking down inside it, you can see all the little chevrons in it. Now, um, if you've got something really big, you're at NASA. This is the largest vacuum chamber in the world. It's 100 feet diameter, 125 feet tall. And uh, I don't have a picture of the pumps. So I would like to try and get a hold of that. But there are just a huge array of pumps to do this. And this is where you would test something you were going to send to Mars to break down. Now we're going to switch away from pumps and talk about how to measure the actual pressure we have. And if you look at all these numbers here, they're all reading the same pressure. They're just different numbers for them. So this will allow you to help convert. Uh, traditionally, people use four, but now millibar or pascal are the ones that you're going to see. And if you're going to write a paper, that's how it should be reported. We're going to look at four different types of pressure gauges. And the first one will be a Borden gauge. Then we'll go to thermocouple, ion gauge, and cold cathode gauge. Why do you need more than one gauge? We're measuring pressures from, uh, well, the pressure in our XPS today is almost 10 to minus 11. You're going to atmospheric pressure, which is 764. Well, that's like 12 orders of magnitude. That's testing a lot for one gauge. Normally, you have combinations. You have something to read your pore pump pressure, which is like a thermocouple gauge, and maybe an ionization gauge or cold cathode gauge. The Borden gauge is something I'm sure you've seen everywhere. It's a really simple mechanism. If you look at the picture on the right side, you see this tube that's bent in a, a circle. As the pressure increases, the closed end moves in an arc. And the motion is converted into rotation of a gear and then an indicator. So I'm sure you've seen these types of gauges. If you look at your regulators, you're going to see them. But if you look inside it, and I love the way they bent this one, and you'll see some little gearing arrangement here, and that's all that moves this gauge. So you can see that this is not the most accurate gauge. Again, you've just got a little gear arrangement here. And you can see that if you bend this out, you're going to move the gauge with the gearing. And that's the indicator that you're going to have. Again, that's your board and gauge, a very, very common gauge. Change in the temperature of the heated wire is measured with a thermocouple. The heat transfer of the wire increases with gas pressure. More gas, more heat loss, lower temperature. And when you look at these, if you cut it apart, you can actually see two wires intersecting with each other. That's all that's in there. Now we'll, we'll again show these all together in a minute. So the next gauge is an ionization gauge. And again, for you need a nice physics experiment, you have a filament which generates electrons. The electrons can ionize the gas. The gas is collected on the, the, the grid helps attract the um, electrons. The electrons are then ionizing the gas. The gas is collected on the collector. As the, the ionized gas is collected. If you have more gas, then you have a higher current. And you can calibrate this to read a pressure. This shows you an example of one of these gauges. And you can see the collector here. You often have a thoriated iridium filament. Why is that instead of tungsten? And the reason is that the thoriated iridium is more resistant in case you have a boo boo like uh, opening something up to air. So as actually happened to me, I've seen uh, the uh, tungsten ones get fried, the story really ones do not. Here's a tungsten filament, and you can fill them apart because it will have a little coil in here um, in the filament design. Remember the older ones were glass, but really advise you not to have a glass one. 
if you if you hit one of these with something, it's going to implode and you have glass everywhere. The designs that are now used are virtually all the new style, which is the picture on the right. The last gauge is the cold cathode ionization gauge. This is called a penning gauge. And in it, another nice physics experiment, you have a high voltage magnet, you're generating a plasma, you get this, this discharge, you ionize gas molecules, they become positive and you put them on the collector. So once again, you have a gas ionization and then a collection of the current. You calibrate that to get the pressure reading that you want. These gauges uh, are very compact. The only problem is, is that uh, they tend to need cleaning periodically and can be a little bit erratic when that occurs. That was a cold cathode gauge in the one that we showed earlier. Here's what one looks like. You can see some the deposits on the inside here. Here's the hole view and the on the right end. The magnet that you're seeing is actually pretty strong. You do not want your credit card to be near. So let's go back to Roberto and we'll show those gauges physically. So here was the uh, Thermocouple gauge. And if you look inside, you can just kind of see there are a couple of wires in there. That's about 250 bucks. Here's what it looks like not cut apart. If you see one of these, they're pretty rugged. I've seen one filled with oil, drained it out, and still works. Here's your iron gauge. Here's a glass one. If you see these, Get rid of them. But here's what the new gauge looks like. And you can see you've got the collector in the middle, the grid, and the filament would be on the side. And here is the cold cathode gauge. Very strong magnet. And inside you would see this. And you can see perhaps some deposits on this. So these are the components in there. You can take them apart and clean them. This other one that I'm showing you is a more modern view and it's a compact gauge. It may include a thermocouple gauge and a cold cathode gauge. And now you're talking maybe, I don't know, $1,500 or $2,000 for that. Ouch. Now, this is an actual rubber hose from our focus ion beam instrument. And a lot of vibration over time just broke it down. We we're wondering why it was not working that well uh, in terms of pumping. So it's just something you need to check if you've got rubber hoses. You have these windows which are on the vacuum system. They're actually fairly thin. So if you hit it with a hammer, you could probably break it. I've never seen one break, I've seen one crunch. But this is your weak point in a vacuum system, and I'll give you some risk that it would be broken. The bellows that you see that are used are actually all individually welded. And you need to support this because as you pump on it, you're going to move it if it's, it will either compress or bend depending on how you have this arranged. So you have to support both ends. The uh, gate valve, this is a very large one. We'll do a very short demo on gate valve in a little bit, but uh, gives you an idea of the, the way that this particular one would move. This is a very large one, so as you open this, you'll be able to move something large in and out. And uh, we'll show the gate valve in just a little bit. The motion on this is a little bit different. Something important to note on the gate valve, if you look on this side, There's a little O-ring right in here. That's your seal. And as I close this, you'll see it go up to it. But unless I lock it in, if I would put a vacuum on this side and there's no vacuum on that side, it would pull it away. So all your gate valves 
you have to tighten and make sure that that locks in. Otherwise, we can have a, a vacuum disaster. All right. So uh, now we're going to we're going to move on to gas cylinder safety. And we're not going to show all of these, but let's go to the Mythbusters video. High pressure gas cylinders have been around for a hundred years, and legends of their destructive potential have been around for 99. But could a ruptured tank really burrow through a brick wall? Into the next county. Here we go, shearing the regulator off a tank. Attempt number two in five, four, cross your fingers, three, two, one. They just knocked off the, yeah! the valve That's on the, the cylinder. <laughs> now we're going to go inside and take a look. That is a lovely, lovely sound. They're happy. The valve has sheared clean off, and that's a very good sign. It looks like the cylinder flew straight and true, but did it have enough thrust so to crack the, the wall? Cylinder. They had cameras set up inside. <laughs> oh, God. Now they're really happy because they saw what it happened. It was the lard that did it. <laughs> <laughs> At 40 miles per hour. If you look, that gas cylinder made a hole through the concrete wall and kept going. And it went to the next wall and started to dig through that. The idea behind this is to show you the power that is contained in your gas cylinder. And now you'll see a video of seeing it just zoom right on through. I'd heard the story, but no one knew anybody that it happened to. You know, this was an optimum situation for this tank. Uh, what this tank did is as good as it gets. My favorite thing is just the perfect roundness of the top of this hole. It oh, also pushed amazing. this entire wall back. All right, Anna, we can go to the next video. When a typical cylinder is filled to its design pressure of 2,400 PSI, it will contain almost 300 cubic feet of atmospheric pressure gas, or about 160 times the internal volume of the cylinder. This compression of gas represents a tremendous amount of stored energy. If the outlet valve is broken off, the sudden release of compressed gas can turn the cylinder into a missile with energy to shoot through a cinder block wall. In one reported incident, a damaged cylinder penetrated two sheet metal walls before becoming airborne and exiting through the roof. The tank reached an altitude of 140 feet before falling back through the building's roof a second time. When a steel cylinder becomes a projectile, it can move with great force, at high speeds, and in unpredictable directions, with the potential to cause serious or fatal injuries. So hopefully we got your attention with that one. And you've got a regulator because you're going to dispense the gas. You have things you should be very aware of. One of them is the cylinder valve. And then you have a regulator which has a cylinder pressure and a delivery pressure. And then you have your delivery valve. Inside that regulator is a membrane. And if you look on the right, you can see this little diaphragm. So as you adjust the pressure, you're going to see this membrane move in and out. And that regulates the gas flow that you're going to get. Why are there a whole range of different regulators? They all have what are called CGA, Compressed Gas Association Fitting. And the reason is you can't use one regulator for all gases. If you have used one for oxygen and now you put in maybe something like hydrogen sulfide, you may not be very happy. The regulators have different fittings, so these fittings match only very specific gases. Your very most common one is probably CGA 580 for helium, neon, argon, and nitrogen. You have to be careful of the regulators. The ceiling surface, even this little dent here, renders this regulator useless because it will leak. And we'll show that in a minute on the uh, camera. So when you're going to change the cylinder, first of all, you leave the cap on 
and the cylinder valve closed. Regulators used for specific gases. We do not transport the cylinder with the regulator in place. We're going to secure the cylinder to something like a hand truck, and we'll show you one of those during transport. And you must secure the cylinders so that they're not going to fall over. And in storage, you have to separate them. You have to be careful for certain gases or certain fittings or certain metals you do not want to use. We do not use Teflon tape on the cylinder fittings. And we don't want to have oil and grease get in there either. And when there's a very small amount of gas, that's when you should start to get your refill put in. And mark the empty cylinders. It's very distressing when somebody goes to use a cylinder and finds out it's empty. And I'm going to show you the different ways to retain the cylinders. We'll show you a few pictures first. So here is one of the wall mounting. There's a floor mount, which has a ring which you can slide over the cylinder. And the next one, which is a floor mount. So we're going to show you those, and then we're going to show you how to change the gas cylinder. Here's a regular that's been taken apart. Here's that ceiling surface right here. And this one has actually been damaged. Here's your normal regulator with cylinder pressure, delivery pressure, regulator, and this one has a delivery valve here. Here's another regulator, and you see the connection is quite different. It's actually a Teflon seal. You see that this attachment here has a cut through it. This is a not righty tighty lefty loosey. It's the opposite. It's a left handed threaded one. You only have so many possibilities for all of these. And so they needed to use some of them that attach the other way. This is a lecture bottle one. So you can see it's like a mini version of the other ones. This one is for oxygen. So now. So here's your gas cylinder. And we're going to look at this and say, all right, I'm out of gas, or I think I'm out of gas. Let's find out. Oh, there's a little bit of gas left. All right. So here's your four mounted one. Here are a couple of wall mount designs. And they're very easy to set up, and you'll see you just clamp it on to the support with the cylinder in here. And there's your floor mounted design. We just roll it onto here and then capture it this way. Now we're going to go back to changing the cylinder. First thing we're going to do is remove what we've got connected to the rest of your system. Now we think we've actually closed the valve here, the cylinder valve. How can we be sure? Well, I've opened the delivery valve. I see I have zero pressure. Which means it's safe to make this to break this connection. All right, so we're going to remove this. And you notice there are a lot of threads on these. You've got maybe 2,500 psi in the cylinder when you use it. You don't want it to have just two threads. Now, if you look at this, 
There is no Teflon tape on here. And I'm going to inspect the inside, especially. So I've taken this one off. I'm going to now put the cylinder cap on. And then once I've got this on, I can safely move it. In case you need a specialty tool for your toolbox, this tool is actually designed for removing. If you see one of these around, don't throw it away. All right, so now we've brought the new gas cylinder in. I'm going to take this off. And notice that while he's attaching it and when he was removing it, he's supporting it, the uh, regulator with his other hand. Um, you don't want to leave all the pressure on those threads. Okay. All right, so how tight do you have to make this? You don't need to be a big bodybuilder body builder to do it. If you haven't messed up with that seal, and first of all, I'm going to tilt this a little this way. So I'm not such a big guy, but that should be sufficient. So now I'm going to open my cylinder. I'm going to close the delivery valve, open this up. And now I'm going to open the delivery valve. And with the regulator, I can adjust to get the gas flow that I want. Once I've achieved that, I can close the delivery valve, then reattach what's going to my actual experiment here. And uh, I don't know if we actually showed you this carrier. This is the kind to buy because you can easily roll around and not worry about it tipping over. So um, we're out of time, but that covers what we were interested in covering. Thank you for your attention. If you've got questions, you can send an email. And I want to thank Anna and Roberto and Toby and everybody that's helped to put this on. And uh, again, uh, that's what we got. See you later.